chapter 1. So uh, tonight we're going to be looking at verses 6 through 9, but let's please read verses 1 through 9, because verse 6 has this wonderful word called wherein. And it, it harkens back for us to pay attention to what was previously said. So do we have our Bibles open already? Boys, do we have our Bibles open? There's tons of Bibles in the back. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God, through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, ye love, in whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Now, this is really important because the first five verses is stating, it's talking to hurting Christians, hurting Christians that are being persecuted. And when we talk about persecuted Christians, sometimes we think about people that are being tortured and burned at the stake. That's not exactly what these people are going through. At this time, their persecution is probably they're losing family members because they don't want to be around Christians. They're losing job opportunities or maybe losing their jobs altogether. They're being mocked because of their stand for Christ. Uh, does any of that sound familiar? Yeah. So literally, we can identify with these people, I think, on a proper scale. And there's a couple things I just want to remind you of. Um, if you look at verse 3, it says that we have a lively hope. That word lively is living. We have a living hope um, because of the resurrection of Christ. He is alive. And we have a living hope because it's not just some dead religion. It's not a list of rules and regulations, but it's literally the God of the universe wanting to take residence in your life. He wants to not just uh, have you uh, throw some incense on an altar. He doesn't just simply want you to bow down. He doesn't want you to obey a certain amount of sacraments. He literally wants a relationship with you, a father-son relationship. And even beyond that, like with Abraham, he wants to have a friend-to-friend -friend relationship. Now, that's something to rejoice about. Uh, I like, I, I was uh, looking through Facebook, and some friends of ours, uh, Chloe and Jay, they're in the Guinness Book of World Records. And it's, it's because uh, they currently hold a record for the uh, um, biggest uh, distance in height between a married couple. Jay is three foot three. And she is not. 
And, uh, and it's nice to say, wow, I know these people. That's cool, isn't it? And sometimes, you know, when there's a conversation, you go, oh, yeah, actually, I, I, I know somebody from there. I know that. That's really great. But I want the name drop of all name drops is, oh, yeah, by the way, I know God. And he knows me. And actually, we're really good friends. And that's something to rejoice about. Then it says in verse 4 that we have an inheritance that is incorruptible, undefiled, fadeth not away, and it's reserved for you in heaven. And that's great. So let me ask you a question. If your salvation is incorruptible, can you corrupt it? No. If if your salvation is undefiled, can you defile it? No. If your salvation fadeth not away, can you lose it? No. And it's reserved for you. It is reserved for you. Verse 5, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. And this is, and by the way, I've, I've got some really good friends who I love dearly that believe you can lose your salvation. Okay? Some really good friends. And one of the things that I'm always reminded of is that I don't have to keep my salvation. If I had to keep my salvation, I'd be in trouble. The scripture says we are kept kept by the power of God. Now, either we're kept or not. Now, I always hear, well, uh, and, and by the way, when, you, when people talk about losing your salvation, it's, they're not always on the same level. But they say, well, if, if, you, if you grieve the Holy Spirit and you don't repent, then you're going to lose your salvation. And my question is kind of this. Okay, so you sin, you grieve the Holy Spirit, and are, are you lost? Well, no, no, no. You just have to repent. I get it, but are you lost until the point that you repent? At what point is your salvation lost? Then you repent, then you get it back. At, at what point in, in your life, or, or are, you just, uh, are you still a Christian the whole entire time, and then at the very end do you lose it? It's a very difficult thing to nail down. And I think one of the reasons why it's very difficult to nail down is because we don't have to, we are kept by God. And with that, verse six starts off saying, wherein, because of all these things, we greatly rejoice. I mean, greatly rejoice. This is a, a superlative on another superlative, joyce, what, what does it mean to have joy? Yeah. Well, that could be part of it. Happy, that's part of it. Joy, you know, where you're, uh, where you have a, an inner peace, maybe a happiness, something around there. I'm, I'm just trying to give some, some common ideas. That doesn't go away. Yeah. That, that when circumstances dictate we're sad, we can still have joy. Your wife is in the hospital. It is possible to still be joyful. Not joyful that she's in the hospital. That's a terrible situation. But there's still a joy. There's not a, a mystery. But it doesn't say to have joy. It says we rejoice. You, you know the sign for infinity? It just keeps on going back on itself and keeps on going back on itself. Rejoice means you have joy, then you have it again, then you have it again, then you have it again, then you have it again. What, when I was a kid, I don't know, you, you're probably too young for this. 
Gene, you might even be too old for this. I don't know. But maybe your husband had a, uh, a VIC-20 computer, one of those old original like Apple computers or, or one, an original computer. And on line 10, you know, you'd write 10 dot something. And then you'd write a phrase and then you'd write 20, go to 10. And then you press enter and it just cycle. It just keep on repeating itself. We go, wow, how cool is this? It doesn't stop. That's the idea of rejoicing. It doesn't stop. But it says we greatly rejoice. Why? Because of everything God has done for us, for everything he's prepared for us, for because he has given everything. And then it says, wherein we greatly rejoice, though now for a season. If need be, you're in heaviness through manifold temptation. What makes us rejoice? Our guaranteed salvation. Now again, sometimes rejoicing can be tough. But how do we, or let me rephrase this, why do we rejoice in temptation, in the actual temptation, in the trial, in the thing that's going against us? How about this? That you have a faith that can be tried. When an oyster is producing a pearl, it has a, uh, some gr grit of sand that's now stuck in the oyster's uh, soft lining and it hurts. It hurts a lot. So that oyster secretes uh, some, uh, some fluids around it and it constantly is secreting it and secreting it and secreting it to, so that that irritation is now comfortable. And then when you pry open an oyster's mouth, you have a pearl. It's the temptation, it's the irritation, it's the problem that allowed for a pearl to be produced. In the same way, when you have something of fine gold, uh, there's, there's 10 karat gold, there's 8 karat gold, there's 14 karat gold, there's 22 karat gold. And all of that, the higher the carat, it goes up to 24 carat. The higher the carat of gold is the higher of purity. Now, we, you know, could you imagine if I had a bar of one carat gold? Yeah, a lot of junk in there, right? But if I had a bar of 24 carat gold, that would be worth well over a million pounds. Now, if you had to be something, what would you rather be? One karat gold or 24 karat gold? Which one? 24, sure. But what do you have to go through to be that pure? Fire. Being melted down. Those impurities of life being ripped out. The end result is always nice. Uh, I have a friend that's an artist. And every once in a while... She's asked, wow, uh, it, you know, I, well, she, she's told us, I could never do that. I'm just not born with this talent. She'll say, neither was I. I just work at it really hard. Yeah, yeah, but look what you can do. I can never do that. Now, now she's actually had works in Tate Modern over in London, okay? And she says, I'm, I will, I, I'm not this naturally. I just... I'm at it and at it and at it and at it. And with, with the practice, with the perseverance, that's what causes something to happen that's of great quality. And, and when we go through trials, when we go through these temptations, that should not make us feel like our faith is negated. Our faith is not negated. It, it, our, a trial does not negate who we are in Christ, but our trial confirms who we are in Christ. You will find this, and I'm going to talk to you boys for a second. You're going to find in life that when you get really serious about God, when you really start pursuing what God wants, you're going to find that your life is going to be miserable. 
Doesn't that sound exciting? Isn't that great encouragement? You know why? Because once you get serious about the things of God, you then become a serious enemy to the wicked one. And he will begin to hurl things at you and throw things at you because your faith is real. We don't attack friends. We attack enemies. And your faith will be tried once you start standing and becoming a true enemy of wickedness. By the way, our rejoicing does not always seem reasonable. Our rejoicing is not because of circumstances. Somebody said, uh, I asked somebody, how are you doing? Well, under the circumstances, not that great. Have you ever talked to somebody and it was always like talking to Eeyore? Well, at least my head hasn't caved in. You know, it's, it's just always... And, and then you ask them and you're almost like, oh, I didn't mean to ask you. I know what it's going to be like. It's going to be terrible. And so I asked this person, so how are you doing? And they said, well... Under the circumstances, what could you expect? I said, you know, how about we stop being under our circumstances and start being over our circumstances? Let's get on the other side of it. Let's not let circumstances control us. Our rejoicing is not based on circumstances. Our rejoicing is based upon what we know and believe about God. How can you rejoice when your wife is in the hospital? How can you rejoice when your, bi when your baby seems to be in distress? Those aren't great situations. How can you rejoice when you or a loved one has a terminal cancer? How can you rejoice in this? Because you still know who God is. And it's what you believe about him. When your faith is tried, we get to see what we're really, really made of. I, I, I was a coach, and uh, I was trying to help out another team at our school. And I, I tell you, they practice this one play, and they're really good. And, and, and I said, uh, I said, you, you really need to swap out this guy. He can't handle the ball well. You need to get your your best player on the ball and, and they're like no 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 you don't understand we had this guy on the ball um because um our best guy's eventually going to get past you and he's going to make the plays and all that sounded great in theory until we they stopped practicing and they were actually in a game and they were getting beat by something like 40 to nothing in the first half because that that guy that had the ball Though he was okay in practice, once he was no longer in practice, once he was playing in a real game, he got the ball stolen from him repeatedly. And it's outside of the practice ring, outside of the training arena, is where we find out what we really know. And that's why it's vital for us to have trials in our lives. One of the most heartbreaking circumstances I personally ever was in was in early October, August 2004. I'm, I'm feeling ill. I got like one of those summer colds. And I'm just feeling bleh. And I'm, I'm at the pharmacy and I'm getting uh, some prescriptions done. And while I'm there... My phone rings, and it is, boys, and the phone rings, and it is somebody. I, I don't recognize the number, but I'm like, okay, who is this? Uh, hi, hi, can I help you? And it's my daughter on the other end, and she's screaming, and she says, Dad, they're dead. Dad, it's terrible, Dad. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not understanding what's going on, and I said to my daughter, I said, Dana, if this is a joke, it's not very funny. And she said, hold on, and, and she got the phone. Uh, to a lady, and she says, um, she says, uh, um, some people uh, from your church, they were just in a terrible bus accident. Um, their back of the bus was hit. 
there, uh, the bus went into a canal and we're pretty sure some of the kids have died. And my daughter was in absolute, she was torn up. And that next day was Sunday when our church was going to have this big celebration in sending us the pickets to England. And the heartache that was going on was unimaginable. We had news cameras from all over the world at our church. Matter of fact, when we when we got here on that Monday, um, they were still showing some of that on ITV News. And I'll never forget what my pastor said when he came to the pulpit. He said, I guess we need to find out now if our faith is real or if it's simply theory. See, a faith that cannot be tested, a faith that it cannot be tried, is a worthless faith. Do you get that? Our heaviness in a trial, by the way, is also reasonable. When a trial brings about sadness, disappointment, sorrow, anxiety, those are real things. And those aren't, those aren't going against faith. That's not going against truth. It's realizing the situation of how terrible. Do you think? Do you think in that situation everybody in church is going, hey, praise the Lord, three of our kids died. Yay! Do you think that was going on? Of course not. But there was a living hope. There was a hope that there was a real God that knew what he was doing. And there was also a clearer understanding that there was a real enemy that hated what our church was doing. I told my wife this. I said, I'll never be, uh, I'll, I'll never stop being convinced that this was attack of the wicked one because our church was making an investment in England. Our heaviness, though, is just for a season. Our salvation, not our troubles. That's what's eternal. Our trials may be big. Our trials may be small. You may never have a trial like that, but you could. Our trials sometimes will seem very common, everyday stuff. Some of our trials will seem life-changing. But we can rejoice because we know that there's a real God in heaven and that, and that our faith is something that can be tried. Now, make no mistake, some people, when those kids died, said, oh, God just wanted to, to call three of his little angels to heaven. Now, I, I remember my pastor's response to that. He says, that's a wicked thought. He said, God did not orchestrate a car accident to kill three kids. Though he was still on the throne. That was a wicked act. And we can still rejoice, though things seem so hurtful. Verse 7, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perisheth, I... I, I like, you know, when, when, when people get really, really wealthy, you know, they, they get a lot of gold chains. Remember Mr. T? Remember all his gold chains? What, uh, he, he one time uh, got them all twisted around and he was choking. It was strangling him. And, uh, and they, they'd end up having to like put them all in like one big loop on the back that you wouldn't see. But that stuff perisheth. It goes. Though it be tried by fire, it might be found unto the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Our faith is on trial. Now, the, this word trial is kind of not like a, at a court to find out if somebody's guilty or innocent. 
It's on trial. It's a smelting process whereby impurities are ripped out. Anytime something hits you, a trial of your faith, God is trying to knock off the hard edges. God is trying to purify what you have. And isn't that a beautiful analogy of our faith? Fire does not destroy the gold. Your trials do not destroy you. Fire does not destroy the gold. Fire brings out what's best in the gold. Listen, a trial comes, a, a problem comes, heaviness comes. Uh, again, it could be common, it could be huge, it, it could be life-changing, it could be so many different variables, but those come so that really who we are will come out. I remember one of my children, they were in another room and I went by and I just heard some very not nice words come out of their mouths. And I opened the door and went, excuse me? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Dad, I didn't mean to say that. I'm like, no, you meant to say it. You didn't mean for me to hear it. See, out of the heart, the mouth speaks. What comes out when we're being tried really shows who we are. There's this one sweet saint over in Bath. Sweet, sweet girl. And she says, can you all pray for me? I feel like I'm getting so apathetic. And I said, I said, listen, if you're worried about being apathetic, I promise you, you're not apathetic. You're struggling. You're fighting. Keep fighting. Keep struggling. It's okay to struggle in your faith. Struggle. Str you know what? You might struggle against a python. Well, if you're struggling, guess what that means? You're still alive. Struggle. Struggle. Trials are not there to make us doubt. Trials are there so we can see what is genuine. Do you get that? What you really believe comes out at a trial. Have you ever been in a situation, and at the end of the situation, a temptation, um, a pro something's gone on, and you look back and go, I did not know I was so weak in that area. That's why God allows trials to happen. Not so God can find out. God already knows. We need to find out. And then we, then we go, God, I don't want this. Do you think Peter felt convicted after the first time he said he denied the Lord Jesus. Do you think he felt convicted the first time? I do. So why did he allow, why did God allow him the second time? Because that needed to get out of him. The desire to turn, uh, turn his back on, on these tough times. Peter had to get to the point in his life when actually the stakes got higher. That Peter would say, I'm never doing that again. Trials will come. Problems will come in your life so you can see what's really there. So you can see what's genuine. And that's the reason why we can rejoice after trials. Because we can rejoice. Hey, God's working on me. Hey, God showed me something. Hey, wow, I'm a lot stronger in this area than I thought I was. The trine of gold would never be complete until the person who is refining the gold, until the person can see his own face. There's something spiritual there, I think. Our trials stop when we're Christ-like, when we're reflecting Him. Verse 8, Whom having not seen, you love. Any of you actually seen Jesus? 
If you have, I'd like to have a talk with you after the service. We can be able to get you maybe some help or something. But even the drawing, how do you know that's, is that what Jesus looked like? You don't know. Probably not, though. Nope. Those paintings happened centuries after he was alive, uh, resurrected. Yeah, so we, we, we probably have no idea. None of us have seen him, yet we love him. Isn't that amazing? We love somebody that we have never seen. And it says, in whom, though now ye see him not, yet believe. You rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Sometimes we think that if we actually saw Jesus, we'd never stray. Oh, if one day Jesus would just appear in my room, man, that would set me on the right path. Did, did that work for Peter? Did that work for Judas? No, simply seeing Jesus wasn't enough, was it? It's loving Christ. We love Christ, not based upon sight. It's based upon having a very real and tangible relationship. We love him because he first what? Loved us. We trust Christ. When you truly love somebody, you have to trust them. When someone loves you faithfully and unconditionally, you love them and you trust them. We trust Jesus through some really, really tough circumstances in life because we know that he loves us. We know that he cares for us. We know that he is faithful to us. We know that it's unconditional. And it says, not only do we love him, not only do we believe in him, but it says we rejoice. We rejoice in Christ because our trials help us to learn so much more about Christ. By the way, think about the people in the Bible that were tried. Think about Abraham. We've been studying Abraham. Okay? Guys, we're up here. Don't worry about it. He's just going tinkle. Okay? We... How did Abraham do in his trials? Good or bad? Bad. Except for the very last one. Man, he nailed that one, right? Huh? And that was the hardest one. See, it's nice to read these people, and sometimes we forget about their failures because we see um, you know, some of the great results. Your story hasn't been finished yet. One of the great promises that I read in Scripture, it says that we have been predestined to be conformed to His image. And our trials, our failings, is to drive us closer to Him. Believe it or not, I've had a son that I've had to discipline before. And you know, more than once, the discipline will cause him to just fly to me and hug me and say, Dad, I'm sorry. The trials, the disciplines, what we have, are not to teach him a lesson. It's to make us return, to fly to Christ, to rejoice in him. And our joy, the Bible says, we rejoice with a joy unspeakable. What does it mean? What does unspeakable mean? It means that it goes beyond true and proper verbal description. Try to... I, I used to do this with, with my kids. I'd say, what color is the grass? And they would say, what? Green. I'd say, what color 
is the carpet? And they would say red. And I'd say, what color do you think God is? I go, clear? <laughs> or something like that. I go, what do you think God looks like? And there's no way the answer could be had because it's unspeakable. You just can't describe it best. And, and when somebody asks us, how can you have joy? How can you have trust in Christ? Though this terrible event happened, you're able to say, it's hard to describe. It's unspeakable, but I'm so rejoiced in him. And what's the purpose of the trial of our faith? Look at verse 9. Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Listen very carefully. Doing everything right does not mean you have salvation. But when you are tried, when your faith is tried, it should assure the believer of who he belongs to. All right, without going into details, Robert, Robert, uh, Natalia, do you feel you've ever failed God? And how did that make you feel, fail, feeling like you failed God? Very bad. If you didn't care about God, would you feel very bad? Did, did you feel in such a way that you never wanted to have that feeling again? You never wanted to, to uh, uh, dis, uh, dishonor God that way again? Trying of your faith, even though it wasn't perfect, showed who you belonged to. It showed, not just showed, it assures you. And we receive the proper and deserving ending of biblical saving faith, which is the salvation of our souls. And it's not one day our souls will be saved. It's that when, when we can see that our faith is something that can be tested, this is something that, that assures us that things are good. You can have the best boat in the world, but if you're afraid to put it in the water, what's the point? Parachutes weren't made to do anything other than help somebody safely jump out of an airplane, right? The trying of your faith is not there to hurt you, it's to help you see what's really there, to create what is valuable, and to assure you of who you really belong to. Okay, let's pray. Father, thank you um, uh, 